All right, let us enter into worship by going to God in prayer. Almighty God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, open your word and illumine our darkened world that we may see clearly and live faithfully by the light of your truth in Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. By grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. This is the judgment that the light has come into the world. For people love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Let us uncover our sin before the liberating light of Christ. In the hypocrisy of our complaints, we grumble about the evils in our world, even as we commit injustices and profit through deceit. We fret about the scarcity of resources, while avoiding the earth's fruits, cheating the poor. We protest the problems of our world, but we do not have to work Merciful God, Expose our sins before the light of your grace. Heal our sin and free us from our foolish ways, that we may know the joy of eternal life. In Jesus' name, in whose name we pray. Amen. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven.
Good morning. Well, we're sitting in a different place because we need to look at different things today. So I want you to look straight ahead. Now, not, not, not at the choir. The choir's sitting back there. But look, look to the sides and up above the choir. What do you, what do you see? What's, what's up there on the wall? That painting up there. You know, do you have an idea what that is? That's the burning bush. In Exodus chapter 3, when Moses goes out into the desert, he meets God's voice at a burning bush. So when we look at that picture, it reminds us to think of the story of Moses and the burning bush. What about right below it? Are there, there are letters there? Mm -hmm. They kind of look like our letters, right? Like I and C and X and K. But actually, they're supposed to be Greek letters. And the ones on the top left, the I and the C, in the Greek language are the first and last letters of Jesus' first name. The K and C, or the X and C, are the first and last name of Christ in Greek. And the N-I-K-A in Greek, that means is victorious or has conquered. So when we look at that, it says Jesus Christ is victorious. What about up there? Can you see that one? Kind of looks like a bird. Do you have any idea what kind of bird that is? That's a dove. That's a dove coming down, and the dove is a symbol of the Holy Spirit of God. So whenever we look at the picture of the dove like that, we can think of God's Holy Spirit. What about the one below it? What does that look like? Kind of looks like an open book, doesn't it? Well, it reminds us of the Bible, right? So is that the burning bush up there? Or is that just a picture? It's just a picture, right? That's, that's not really a dove, is it? No, that's, that's just a picture of a dove. These are symbols. And symbols can make us think of things we know about God, things we know from the Bible, and can make us think every time we're here about God. All right. Does anybody, was anybody here not here last week and needs a cardboard fish? <gasps> you need a cardboard fish. Anybody else need a cardboard fish? Okay, well, if you guys need more cardboard fish, come let me know, and I have more cardboard fish. And remember to be filling these with money. That's right, and bring them back on Easter. Very good. Yes, we're going to bring them back on Easter, and we're going to give them to God. All right, before you guys go and see Miss Katie in the back of the sanctuary, let's pray, okay? Repeat after me. Dear God, thank you. For giving us signs and symbols to remember you always. In Jesus' name, amen. As we come to our time of hearing God's word to us, let us first pray for God's wisdom so that we may truly hear God's word to us. Almighty God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, open your word and illumine our darkened world that we may see clearly and live faithfully by the light of your truth in Jesus Christ. Amen. Our responsive gospel reading is from John chapter 3, verses 14 through 21, which can be found on page 888 of your Pew Bible. And I invite you now, as you are able, uh, as we have done all this Lenten season, to please stand for the reading of God's gospel. I will read verses 14 and 15. And then we will alternate a verse at a time between you, the congregation, and me, the leader. So beginning in John chapter 3, beginning in verse 14. And Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into our world to condemn the world, 
but in order that the world might be saved through him. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light, because their deeds were evil. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his deeds have been carried out in God. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Our second reading can be found on page 129 of the Pew Bible, and it comes from the book of Numbers, chapter 21, verses 4 through 9. Listen again for God's word. From Mount Hor they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, and the people became impatient on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that the people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole, and if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. This is the word of God. Lent, if you have not already discovered it, is more a marathon than it is a sprint. It is more about a journey rather than a short trip, like a long distance race or a long trek. It's useful not only to take stock of where one has been and where one currently is, but where you are looking to go next. So what are our Lenten mile markers for this year? Well, we've passed the Noah marker, noting how God acts first and unconditionally. We've become acquainted with the idea of covenant, that special relationship between God and the people of God. And we've noted that symbols are used to reaffirm to God and to the people of God that the covenant is still in effect. We've passed the point where Abraham and Sarah are handing out water for this long and thirst-driven race, showing that while the scope is universal, the means of living out the covenant are more particular and narrowed and focused. We've noticed that the signs of circumcision for ancient Israel and for baptism for us Christians leave us changed forever by them. Last week, we passed through the giving of the law, that is, the Ten Commandments, and we began to struggle and squirm with the idea of what type of response God might have in mind for us to give back to God who's given so much, to this one who gives the covenant, noting that these precepts, these laws, these rules can only be given and received in the context of proximity and closeness of a God that we are in relationship with. Now looking ahead to next week and beyond, we hit arguably the largest manifestation of God's covenant with us, Jesus Christ. We turn from the Old Testament to John's gospel and see how that narrowing and particularity leads to one person, Jesus. And just as this all-encompassing covenant has said all along from Jesus, how it expands ever outward, including people of all time all places, all situations. But today, we are two-thirds of the way through this Lenten journey, this race, this pilgrimage that is Lent. We've arrived today at what is perhaps one of the most bizarre passages in all of the Old Testament, which is saying something given everything that appears in the Old Testament. Now, the Ten Commandments of last week, they were given at the beginning of 
what was to become a 40-year wandering through the desert, where this account in Numbers regarding the snakes and images of snakes is towards the end of this period of formation for the people of Israel. Now we've given idea or attention to the idea that the covenant is associated and connected with symbols. We've seen rainbows, stone tablets, and more, and today is no different. Yet it's important again to remember that symbols are never the things or the people themselves. They possess no intrinsic power. They cannot control or dictate life, although we often come to see symbols as being very powerful and having the ability to influence life. Think of the symbol of red, yellow, and green traffic lights. Really, it's just three light bulbs that cast off light through colored pieces of glass. Yet, these lights, by turning on and switching off, have the ability to regulate and control the flow of traffic because we give power to that symbol. Or think of our recent history. Think of the symbol of the swastika. Most of us would associate that symbol with National Socialism or the Nazis of Germany during World War II. It remains to this day a rallying point, not only for white supremacists, but for those that would seek to stand against those that argue for racial superiority. In this way, symbols can often serve as standards, and a standard in this sense harkens back to the idea of a battle flag, an image that an army would follow into battle. It is the thing that is carried that anyone in this army can look towards and can see. It gets lifted high. It rallies the people around it. As long as it's up, it's giving purpose to what is going on. And any time it falls, the most important thing to do is to lift it back up for all to see. This is what Moses is called to lift up before Israel, a standard, a flag, a rallying point for the people. So in the midst of a great snake infestation, he is told to lift up another snake. Even in our own life, though, if we want to think lifting up snakes is a little bit odd, we lift up snakes as well in our society. Think of the caduceus or the rod of Asclepius. Both of these symbols show one, or in some cases, two snakes intertwined around a pole. Where do we see these images today? They're all over the place. They're on ambulances. They're in hospitals and doctor's offices. They are symbols of the medical profession, the healing arts. They're symbols that speak, come to this place for help, for aid, for healing. But they're still snakes. Snakes are kind of interesting. There are few things that are as universally feared as a snake. Roughly 32% of all adults will admit to being afraid of snakes, and that makes them one of the most feared things in all the earth. Yet humans have, since at least ancient Greece and likely long before that, have used the snake or the serpent as a sign of healing. So maybe God, through Moses, was on to something here. The text is interesting. Forty years of wandering is almost over. The people of Israel are soon about to enter into the promised land. They are coming to understand what it means to be the people of God. But they now find themselves in the most inhospitable part of the Sinai Desert, one in which they are literally and metaphorically dependent on God for survival. They need water, but God has provided water for them through the rod of Moses. God is provided food for them as well in the provision of manna. Yet these people say, we have no water, we have no food, and the food we have is pretty worthless. We don't like it. There have always been, during this 40-year journey of the people of God, a committee, a let's go back to Egypt committee. In short, they are the ones that have led the nation in grumbling and mumbling and groaning against Moses, and by extension against God. They were the ones that said, you know, sure, we were slaves in Egypt, but you know what? We had food to eat. We had a place to sleep. We had work to do. Why has Moses, why has God brought us out into this wilderness just so we can die? Why don't we go back to Egypt? Anytime God's people are led into an area that is unknown, 
scary or dangerous. The people have always said, why are we going here? Why don't we just stay back here? At least we know what back there is like. But each time the people have grumbled and complained and given grief to Moses, God has answered and provided for them to show them that it's precisely in the wilderness that God meets them and provides for them. But this time, this last time of complaint, God too is explicitly included. And I have to think this was the point where God said, you know, enough is enough. Now the word fiery, that adjective, is actually the Hebrew word seraphim. It's where we get our idea of the seraphim, the fiery angels that attend God in heaven. These fiery, these even angelic-like snakes are sent and they bite the people. Because that's what snakes do. And many people die from these bites. Very quickly, the people realize we've messed up. We've stepped out of line. This is a punishment. They've realized that sin has consequences. We're a lot like Israel, though. We like our sin without consequences. But this, this text reminds us sin, no matter how trivial it seems, always has consequences. But one of those consequences is the power to bring about reflection and repentance as well. And it is in very un-Israel fashion that the people quickly realize and grasp the situation. They promptly seek relief and repentance to turn around and turn back towards God. The snakes came. They brought death. Yet through them, God was going to bring them life. The same is true of the one lifted up upon a cross, another instrument of death through which God brings life. And perhaps this is why Jesus specifically lifts up in our gospel reading, compares himself to one lifted up, just like Moses lifted the snake upon a pole. But note, even though God answers the people when Moses prays on their behalf, God does not remove the snakes. God does not provide immunity for the snake bites. But God does provide for them a way through the hardship. Moses intercedes and is told to create a pole, to create a standard, a rallying point that the people can look to and not just glance or not just notice out of the corner of their eye. No, God tells Moses that these people will have to look at, they will have to focus and train their gaze upon this rallying point. And it's a snake. The very thing that is bringing about their death is the thing they are to look for for life. Hardly a comforting image, wouldn't you think? Looking at the thing that was killing you, your friends, your loved ones. But I also think it'd be quite an effective reminder of what not to do. But Israel was still hedging their bet. No, when they go to Moses and they say, pray to God on our behalf, they say, ask God to take the snakes away. They wanted the consequence of what they had done to go away not what caused it in the first place. So God answers them in a way that defies logic and reason, says, no, I'm not going to take the consequence away. That'd be too easy. You would forget too quickly because people really just want relief and respite from the consequence of sin, not the reformation of self and of will and of purpose that brought it on. But we see not only in this account with ancient Israel, but with Jesus as well, that the call of faith is always a call to radically reorient our lives to the things of God. So in the act of healing, those that are bitten would intentionally look at an image of a snake and in this way perform an act of obedience to God, doing something that is not logical or reasonable. Doing so, acting upon trust then, is what brought healing. So this is really a story about faith. And it speaks to the reality that faith is not really about belief. Because belief we can come to. Belief we can understand and control. Belief we can even change. But trust is much more basic, much more all-encompassing than just the idea of believing. Now think about it. In a movie or in a book, when a hero comes to somebody and offers them aid, do they say, do you believe in me? hero would never say that. They say, do you trust me? That is, will you act in the way that I say to act? 
how I say to act, when I say to act without question? Will you defy logic and reason to do so? Will you commit 100% to me? Because that is what is required. That is what is required also of God. Will we trust God? Now the covenant, that thing that we are traveling through and traveling towards in our Lenten journey, our gospel reading shows us where that journey will take us. It takes us to the one who, like this snake of old, will be lifted up. The image of death becoming, for those of faith, the image of life. We see that in our journey through the Old Testament, even the symbols of the covenant, even all of them point long before his life to Jesus. Now, it is easy to see in this account in Numbers the story of an angry God that punishes disobedient people. We don't like to think about that kind of a God nowadays. Nowadays, it's much more in line to say when bad things happen that God is testing me. But let us be clear, this is neither a story about a sadistic deity, nor is this a story of about a God who sends bad things just to see what people will do, or just to see that maybe they could become better people through it. For when we say, God is testing me, what we're really saying is that we've never really changed from the people of ancient Israel who didn't want the root cause of their sin removed. They just wanted the consequences gone. Because it's our way of saying, well, I'm really good. I'm basically a good person. The only reason anything bad could happen is, well, because God wants to make me a better person, right? No. This reading in our lives testify to the fact that we are sinners, period. It's not a pleasant thought. It's not a happy thought. Just as we are all universally covered in this covenant, Paul also reminds us in Romans 3 that we are all universally sinners, We have all sinned. We all fall short of the glory of God. Like we say in communion, all means all. Well, that's the bad and the negative as well as the good and the positive. It means our world is not as it should be. That things happen that should not happen. That we do things and things happen to us that should not happen. Even if they're not directly related to our choices and actions... Our world is not as it should be. Bad things happen. Now, what is going on here and in our lives when we face our own fiery snakes is that the reality of sin is that it has consequences and that the consequences do not disappear simply when we say, oops, my bad, sorry. But it also shows that this covenanting relationship-driven God, even in these situations, will not waste an opportunity to reach out to us, to stand with us, to be with us in spite of all that we do and say against God. The healing and the wholeness that we seek is not just about seeing and recognizing that we are wrong, but seeking a turnaround, a reconciliation, a restoration between us and God, a true turning of our lives and ourselves over to the one who brings life. Our reading reminds us, especially those of us, all of us, who like so much comfort and ease, that the way of resurrection, and that's what we're working towards here in Lent, we're working towards Easter, that the way of resurrection, of glory, of triumph, that we find stubbornly in that path, the cross of Jesus Christ. We cannot get to Easter Sunday without first passing through Good Friday. We cannot arrive at the empty tomb without first encountering that cross that refuses to get out of our way, no matter how much we wish it would. It reminds us that the road to healing and restoration, that the road to life, oftentimes leads through darkness and pain. There simply is nothing that God cannot work with, though, when it comes to our salvation, and that is the great hope of God, that nothing is wasted, nothing is lost. So what are we afraid of? Are we one of those people that will at least admit we're afraid of snakes, even the metaphorical ones? What makes us cry out for God? What is it that prevents us from even thinking of God or even thinking to reach out to God 
when things are not the way they ought to be. These are not bad things that happen to good people. No, they are bad things, period. But the word of faith, of hope, of trust, of grace is that God is there, even in those times, even in those places, even now when we paint ourselves into a corner, God is there seeking to use it, to redeem it, to bring us life from all the ways we seek after death. In the end, it all comes down to a choice, to a choice of where we will place our trust. Will we trust in God or the snake? Will we choose life or death? Will we choose the evidence of what is in front of us or the evidence from the one who made everything that is in front of us? May we always choose God. Choose God first. This God lifted up, and may we in our lives be the ones lifting up and giving glory to that God who alone can bring life from death. Sisters and brothers, confident in God's love and mercy, let us pray for the world and for our needs, saying, Merciful God, hear our prayer. Holy God, you created us in Christ Jesus for good works. Help those who profess faith in Christ to do good in the world, following the way of life you have prepared for those who believe in him. For the church of Jesus Christ, merciful God, hear our prayer. Your children walk by your light, doing what is true, yet salvation is not earned by good works, but through trust in your grace. Dispel from your children arrogance of heart, that the world may be drawn to your truth by their humble witness. Merciful God, hear our prayer. In every age, you call forth men and women of integrity to lead your people in the way of righteousness. Help pastors and teachers to fulfill their calling. Give them courage to speak the truth in love and shield them from the temptation to misuse their authority. For pastors and teachers, merciful God, hear our prayer. God, your reign encompasses all the earth. Though the nations may rebel against your justice, save the nations from the wrath of their disobedience. Help them to dwell in peace and promote the common good. Governments and leaders near and far, merciful God, Hear our prayer. You hear the cry of the sick and afflicted. Save them from their distress. Heal them of their disease. And deliver from them, or deliver them from the destructive power of suffering. For all who sorrow in distress, in illness, merciful God, hear our prayer. O oh God, in Jesus Christ, you have shown the love you have for the world. Receive our prayers, grant us what we need. Save us from perishing and bring us to everlasting life. Hear us now as we pray, praying as Jesus taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Church, we have received the immeasurable riches of God's grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Go forth to share this gift with others. And may the love of God, the grace of Christ, and the light of the Spirit bless you and keep you in the way of truth. In the name of the Father. Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go with God.